Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to be spending the next 45 minutes or so talking about the challenges in onboarding merchants and managing the risk associated with those merchant accounts. My name is Julie Conroy. I'm a research director with ITA Group. We're a financial services research and consulting firm. And I've spent a lot of time talking to executives across banks, across payment service providers, acquirers, about the increasing challenge associated with vetting the volume of merchants that are coming in, the variety of merchants, and doing so effectively. So we have a great panel here to help us discuss this. Um, we have a nice, intimate group here, so please, I want to encourage you to participate in the conversation. We have microphones on either side of the room. Um, first, I'm just going to ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. So, Allison? Hi, I'm Allison Guidette. I'm the CEO of G2 Web Services, and we monitor merchant risk. Hi, I'm Anand Menon. I'm with MasterCard, and I look at the financial inclusion piece of MasterCard from the product side. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Ufford. I'm the founder at a company called Trulio, based in Canada, and we do global identity verification. Hi, I'm Abby Chafat. I'm the deputy chief compliance officer at WePay, white label payments without the risk partners with uh, platforms. Great. So Allison, you work with a bunch of folks across the ecosystem, acquirers, payment pr processors. You know, as you are working with your clients, what are some examples of the potential merchant risks that these folks are facing? And you know, not, not just the acquirers, but the value chain members as well. Yeah, I think the um, legacy, simple four-party value chain, issuer, acquirer, merchant, consumer, uh, is now a, we call it kind of an end-party value chain. There are literally hundreds of potential intermediaries, dozens of ways to move money, lots of new ways to buy and places to pay, and, and that complexity lends itself to lots of hiding places for bad actors who are increasingly technologically enabled and, and connected amongst themselves. So one example of the you know, dozens of, of new risks that are emerging that we talk a lot about is laundering transactions. And so the merchant that's in an acquirer or a processor or a payment brand's portfolio is selling something innocuous, consulting services or um, supplements. And in fact, that merchant is wittingly or not actually processing transactions for a different merchant that's unknown to the bank that is uh, engaged in something far more nefarious, often drugs. Yeah. So as we, as we look at this complex ecosystem, we're seeing lots of smaller entities coming in. And you know, it can be really challenging to effectively validate and verify these guys. So you know, Steve, we've got these kind of buzzy concepts of AI and machine learning that are coming into play. How are those helping with vetting some of these small guys? That's actually um, a really good way to depict it. I think that there are definitely some buzzwords in the KYC, KYCC, KYB space. Um, it starts with data. Of course, we all know that. You've got to have some data to do um, onboarding. Uh, but what I think is interesting about um, identity, whether it's legal entity identity or consumer identity, is that a lot of the baseline for data is documents still. And so we've seen a lot of new technologies in KYC, which is, includes things like taking a, your mobile phone and um, extracting data from a document that way. Uh, and now we're starting to see this also in KYB, which is um, very similar. Uh, the only difference is the document shifts from a government-issued uh, you know, user or consumer document um, to a business uh, registry document. And um, I think it's very exciting because we've seen a lot of uh, innovation in that space um, on the KYC side. And now in the KYB space, we're seeing the same technology apply. We can, in real time, often get these documents from government registrars. And then AI is being used to um, extrapolate beneficial owners, uh, shareholder tables, directors, um, where previously Data extraction from documents is not new, but when you look across the world, uh, some of those documents are handwritten, some of them are typed up in, from the 80s, some of them are on bubble jet and dot matrix printers, and the forms change over time. And so it was very uh, problematic 
to use extraction from documents for identity, for legal entities. And now AI has, is starting to chip away at that by having smart machines learn where those names are um, and uh, apply that to an ongoing system that gets smarter every time we correct it. And I think that's going to really, in the next few years, um, help automate a lot of the, the micro-merchant onboarding. You know, some of the data uh, specialists in the space track the bigger companies, but not the small, which is very, re very relevant today. Um, single kind of sole proprietors, small businesses, all want merchant accounts and all want to transact online and uh, use digital funds, but are having a lot of difficulty um, often getting those through some of the new providers because there's no visibility into those entities. And this type of technology, AI, um, coupled with OCR and other things, I think will, will go a long way right. in helping. So as we look at the, these smaller merchants, yeah, Anand, with MasterCard, you guys may, recently made the commitment to onboard 40 million micro-merchants onto your network over the next couple of years, which is just a, an awesome number. What kind of barriers do you anticipate you're gonna have to contend with in both traditional and emerging economies? Sure, yeah, and I think you know the bulk of that base of 40 million, when we talk about that number, uh, we do see that coming from emerging markets. And you know, it's not to say that there aren't micro merchants because the digital space is throwing out micro merchants by the millions, right? Everyone's becoming a merchant in their own right. Uh, but that commitment that we made was primarily made from a financial inclusion standpoint of people who are excluded in emerging markets having access to mainstream payment systems that we take for granted. And to that end, I just want to build on what Steve said because he, he made a really good point, right? I think the fact is that today when we have tools like AI, OCR, et cetera, they're only as good as the base instrument that you have to prove your identity. And I think one of the biggest trends that we are seeing, which I think is a huge tailwind for you know, this whole process of onboarding merchants, is governments recognizing that identity is a critical issue. It's becoming a number one priority for many governments around the world. And the route they're taking is towards smart identity. So identity that can be hooked to a centralized database that's harmonized to the back end uh, to various other systems that they have. So any uh, social benefits, any tax identity, et cetera, is all being harmonized uh, to some degree under national identity programs under central database. What that means at the end of the day is one, from a consumer standpoint, that's less information that I have to provide. It's far easier for me to provide one unique identifier rather than find ways to provide multiple documentation. And from a service provider standpoint, it makes the, the process of due diligence and checking that information far more reliable and lowers the risk that they have from a KYC compliance standpoint. So I think you know, that tailwind is one key step. And then from there on, you know, it's working with, there are, there are still various gaps in like the business model, how do we reach these merchants, what other kinds of data can we use to, to lower the risk, to make an accurate risk assessment, uh, and who are the players who are willing to go out there. Uh, so I think you know, there are other pieces, but I just wanted to highlight that one piece based on what Steve had, had mentioned around the base identity. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so yeah, the onboarding is one step but then we're onboarding them so that we can ultimately engage in commerce and transact and make payments. So as, as you're looking at your business, Abby, you know, how can we enable that, those transactions to be as seamless as possible while still meeting the regulatory obligations? That's the challenge, right? That's how we, that's a challenge for all of us, I think, in the space. At WePay, we have adopted this model of a two-step onboarding and it is, I have to explain this to my bank partner literally every month, right? So we're able to onboard a merchant just with their email address and I'm able to start processing payments for you immediately. But before any of those funds go out, then and only then do I force the KYC requirements onto you. We found that our partners really like the flexibility um, and our merchants really like that they can start accepting payments. I mean, think about like a small business wanting to accept payments. They've never accepted payments before. It's a huge deal for their business. They don't want the friction. 
Um, and so they, we've been able to kind of successfully balance the, the, the flexibility and, and offer that uh, pay, immediate payments and putting the KYC on the back end. Innovating on KYC is really hard because it's prescribed, so heavily prescribed in the regs. Um, so we try to meet that as creatively as we can. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, one of the reasons why we have these regs prescribing this stuff is because there's a lot of bad actors trying to get in. Um, and sometimes they do get in. So as you have stuff kind of lurking or obfuscated in these portfolios, how, how are the acquirers and processors you guys work with ferreting this out? Yeah, it's the, that's our business, um, to, to, to partner with payment companies to at boarding, but also on an ongoing basis um, to identify if the merchant that they boarded is indeed how he or she presented themselves initially. And I think what Abby was describing in terms of sort of multi-step um, underwriting or kind of continuous underwriting, and I'm sure you have, I know you have um, sort of very robust compliance activity once you do turn on payments and start paying them, because one of the sort of real challenges is those merchants will pretty themselves up to, to it's a little bit like when you're selling your house, right? You paint the walls and, and fix the carpet and sort of, you know, put a towel over the burn mark on the kitchen <laughs> counter. Uh, so it's a little bit hard for the acquirer to realize um, that, you know, that in fact there's some, some substantive problems. So what we do uh, at underwriting, sometimes as we can find connections between that merchant that might not exist in their credit data, might not even exist in their reputation data. Sort of a fascinating fact is 25% uh, of merchants that are terminated for bad acts, selling illegal sexual content, gambling, drugs, counterfeit, whatever it is, 25% uh, within a week attempt to re-enter the payment system in exactly the same form. They don't change anything. They just de try to dupe another payment company. They might shift to something alt payments for a little while, to try to stay under the radar. And then 50% will morph somehow into something a little bit different and then try to re-enter. And so our task at G2 and, and, and also our clients is to try to identify those clues that connect the uh, merchant applicant to something historical that we have found, um, some uh, indication of risk. And so we do that with data as well. I agree with Steve. Our organizations have thought of some really interesting things that we can do together with our data. We've been collecting data on bad guys for a very long time and, and can use that to, to spot them. But let's say the client is, you know, has a different underwriting system and isn't using us or, or for whatever reason we didn't catch it. Once they're boarded, then there's a whole series of things that, um, that we do and that our clients do to validate that the merchant's product portfolio hasn't veered into the illegal. The really obvious ones when the merchant just you know, shifts from selling pet food to pot. That's not as common now as I think they're, they're getting a little more sophisticated. They can get into laundering. Um, and then there are a whole series of um, additional strategies to try to get two or three steps away from the bank. So at the end of the day, I was thinking a lot about this coming to this conference. You know, it's about helping the payment company to, to know the identity of the business. And every intermediary between the bank and that business um, allows them to hide. Yeah, well, and there's, there's so many different kinds of business, which we don't want to keep any of them out of the ecosystem necessarily if they are legitimate. And I think you know, with your financial inclusion strategies, you know, that's some of the more challenging aspects because you're really going after that base of the pyramid. Yeah. So how, how are you doing that? Yeah, and, and to that point, I mean, they may be legitimate, but in the government's eyes, they may also be evading taxes because they, they operate in the shadow economy, they're you know, cash base, they may not be declaring everything that they typically make. Uh, you know, so from one standpoint, obviously the big carrot, you know, for the government is the fact that once electronic payments are enabled, you know, you will start to see a lot more visibility. And there is a correlation between electronic payments and reduction of the shadow economy. Now, from a merchant side, though, you know, that those are precisely the challenges that they sometimes push back on. And they say, you know, you, you wanted me to declare how much I make now because everything's visible. Like, what's in it for me, right? Why should I accept payments? And I think, you know, that's the piece that is actually going to be uh, increasingly 
you know, where we see the emergence of public-private partnerships. And, and so it's because the government does have a role in, in that space as well. Uh, regulation aside, which is, I think, the big piece, where we've seen successful examples of small merchants voluntarily trying to come up with creative ways of trying to accept payments is when, on the issuing side, the government has facilitated a greater uh, transition from cash to electronic payment instruments. Uh, so, for example, let's pick, like, in Mexico. And this is a really interesting case because, you know, there's a program called Bansefi, where uh, Oportunidad is, where Bansefi is the bank, where they, the government of Mexico moved from paying social benefits from cash to electronic payments. What that meant was that over 10 million rural consumers suddenly started having cards. What that meant is typically where they would go and shop, right? They started trying to find ways in which, okay, I'd rather pay with this card because otherwise I need to go and find a way to withdraw the cash and then come back and pay with pay uh, through the card. And so we saw a huge uptake on the merchant side along, you know, as, as a part of that result. So the government has roles to play even beyond regulation, which regulation is a huge piece. And we saw in India things like, you know, demonetization and stuff like that, the kind of impact it has had on electronic acceptance is a huge element as well. But I think, you know, that's one of the key, uh, you know, enablers of the shift towards electronic payments. And actually, the example you offered with Mexico was, was um, also done in Russia many years ago. And as part of the reason why the Russian economy today is so e-commerce enabled is that's how, you know, the old USSR used to pay out benefits. Yeah. It changes the behaviors of consumers. Mm -hmm. Well, and you talk about regulation, and you know, KYCC is also a big topic, and you know, we're seeing some various, you know, to throw out another buzzword, reg tech types of solutions out there. Um, but what kind of policy shifts are you seeing, kind of in the inter in the international space, Steve, to to help with this? Yeah, that's actually um, probably the most notable shift in KYCC is governments um, starting to embrace in particular international and emerging market governments, uh, this concept of digital identity. Um, as we were just discussing on the panel a few moments ago, the governments have various roles to play, and I think identity remains, uh, as you were saying, um, a, a principal uh, one. But in particular to KYC and KYCC, there's this you know, two-pronged approach, which is, one, uh, let's change the rules um, and it, I don't think Canada is an emerging market, but um, even recently, uh, being Canadian, um, we changed our rules to um, be more inclusive of the digital onboarding experience. So whereas the government was not too prescriptive before uh, for this type of onboarding, it is now, and it's really very data-centric. You've got to have this kind of data and this kind of data and do these things and check these boxes and very prescriptive. Um, but the change there is that it, it is prescriptive and includes data, whereas before it was very general. You know, you've got to kind of use identity, real identity, you know, a document. And now it's been kind of updated. And I think I've seen that in Singapore and Australia and um, now India, uh, even more um, prevalent in emerging markets. China has now, uh, you know, changed the regs. And then the second approach uh, for government is then, if you're going to allow data for KYC and KYCC, make the data available. So we see a lot of, there's a lot of buzz uh, in our industry about open banking. Mm -hmm. I would say that before there was open banking, there was open government. And I've, we, all, we are already aware of half a dozen governments, at least on our platform, that make a, a whole wide variety of data available for KYC and AML. And those will, not just the static, the old electoral databases, uh, we're talking about taxation records, immigration records, um, you, you know, everything, Medicare, uh, all these kind of databases that governments hold for the exclusive purpose of digital onboarding. And, and really inclusion is their message. We want to make sure that new to country, young people, uh, you know, the folks that are not captured by credit bureaus are also able to utilize all these services. We, we think it's important uh, as a government, and so therefore we're going to change the regs and then make the data available. And uh, within our platform, we have a little over 200 integrations to data partners. In the last year, we've seen the number one 
uh, new partner be a government. So that's a huge change in, in terms of, before it was all commercial aggregators and uh, regional uh, you know, data providers. Now it's world governments on the national level making huge data assets available for KYC. And that I think is a merging trend that only has happened in the last few years. So the U.S. is a big outlier there. Yeah, yeah we, that's right. Do you see the U.S. going there anytime soon? Well, there's little hints. Um, you know, so not to throw the U.S. under the bus. So the reason I think government has not been so aggressive here is because the commercial providers are so comprehensive. Uh, we have here in the U.S. data laws that are a little less explicit around consent. And as a result, it has, you know, created a huge ecosystem of data. And with just an email address, your, a phone number, you're able to really build out a consumer profile unlike anywhere else in the world with access. We have over 60 countries in our platform and I still maintain that the US is the most robust ecosystem. And so fit for purpose, when, it, look, when we look at what needs to be accomplished, the question is, and I would imagine this would be the government's response here, do we really need to do this if the capability already exists? When you're in China and the capability doesn't exist, then the government steps in and makes it available. Even Australia, a very similar, uh, you know, more first world use case, similar to the US, large commercial credit bureaus, large aggregators, negative reporting systems. So they're not as inclusive. So government said, well, that's not gonna work. So we're gonna need to open it up. I think the US is, um, despite having this ecosystem though, is starting to show signs. Like I know the Social Security Administration in the last few years has made an API available. And this is new, right? This is a, some movement. Now it's restricted, not everyone can use it, but it, it, it's a first, right? And it's a live connection. It's not offered by a commercial aggregator that's done a deal with the government. This is government standing up technical infrastructure to make services available. So I can't say that there's been no movement, but if you compare it to Australia, there are over a dozen uh, APIs available now in that country for KYC. Well, and as we look at the synthetic fraud problem rising here, and yeah, I think there is need for that government data to, to come to fore, because I think that's the only thing that's gonna help us make a big dent in it at this point. But which agency is going to have jurisdiction? I think that's one of the big <laughs> challenges at the moment yes. in, in the US, um, especially on the sort of YRACH side of the house, is uh, there's a sort of an alphabet soup of, of different agencies, each of which have a, has a piece of jurisdiction, and then there's also the state level yes. legislation, which I think makes the um, compliance very difficult. So I think if the U.S. is going to take a greater push in this space, one, one of them needs to be crowned in charge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or we get a new one altogether. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. yeah. even better. <laughs> We're in the right town for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you look at you know, these you know, KYCC challenges, and as I talk to a lot of processors and acquirers, you know, some of them aren't even willing to touch marketplaces right now yeah. because of the KYCC risk there. But that's also one avenue to bring some of these micro-merchants into the fold. So what are some of the other you know, opportunities to remove barriers and create building blocks to bring the base of the pyramid sure. in? Yeah, and I think you know this is probably the challenge that is going to get the most attention because tailwinds aside, governments are going to do their role, hopefully. Uh, you know, the other pieces will, will come into play. But now it's a question of, okay, how do we collect, and when I use the royal we here, collectively it's part of the payment ecosystem, find ways to, you know, use data that's available. So it's not, today, you know, people transact. They just transact differently. People at the base of the pyramid generate data, but that data is captured differently, mm. right? It's about how do we kind of get to a point where we find effective ways and channels to aggregate that data and make sense of that data. Like, what does that data mean? Because it's very different from, you know, a Facebook profile, whatever data we may use today, right? And those, that data is very relevant for the kind of, you know, scenarios we face in the developed markets. In the emerging markets, that may not be available. Mainstream data may not be available, but there is still data. And it's about trying to find those right partners. And one example of what we're trying to do is, uh, so for example, you know, a lot of clients at the base of the pyramid today engage in formal financial services, but not with banks. They engage 
in that with you know, micro lending institutions, microfinance institutions. These institutions have their own way of underwriting. They have a very robust process. They do uh, you know, place of business checks. They do asset uh, you know, inventory management. Uh, they, do all the, they, they generate a lot of data from, for their purposes for underwriting loans. But the people they lend to are essentially micro merchants. Can we try and find a way to leverage some of that information to make an underwriting decision to, to onboard them as merchants? Right? And so that's just one example. Telcos, uh, you know, uh, distributors of uh, FM, uh, fast moving goods or consumer goods, uh, they all generate a ton of data across the board. And it's about trying to find ways to effectively harness that data and then use it to make a risk assessment for these, for these consumers. So, to follow up on that, <clears throat> what we at WePay, what we've been trying to do, um, and I think we're doing it effectively so far, are partnering with um, platforms or channels that these small businesses have already partnered with historically, right? So if you have an invoicing platform, for example, you have seen invoices for this merchant for the last five, 10 years. Now, how can I use that information to plug it into my underwriting to say, yes, I'm gonna offer you payment services. That's what we've been doing. And we've seen and we feel very confident that we know these people now. We know their business. We know the, their transaction processing volume and we can, we can anticipate what that will look like. Um, it's, it's a very difficult and currently manual way of doing it, but trying to iterate on the technology to help us do that efficiently, that's where I think we have a lot of, a lot of legwork to do. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of um, newer micro merchants, if, if they're not choosing or can't get boarded, not choosing a marketplace or can't get boarded in a marketplace, will turn to a payment facilitator, which is a form of um, what you're describing, Abby. Um, and the card network rules have, have made it easier, but also more controlled to, to be a payment facilitator. Interestingly, though, from the bank side of the equation, acquirers either love payment facilitators or they run entirely in the other direction because it's a in, completely different risk profile and um, level of responsibility that you're taking on because usually the PFs, great relationships with the micro merchants, they offer really sophisticated services and technology. They may or may not know anything about risk. Um, and so a lot of acquirers actually have to execute a complete shadow program of risk and compliance on top of what they're doing, uh, at least for the first couple of years. Yeah, I've, I've talked to plenty of acquirers that just don't have the technology to do that. So they're not willing to touch that business with a 10-foot pole at this point, where it's a shame because there's, you know, compared to traditional business, the margins there are great. Mm -hmm. I, I can keep asking these guys questions for a long time because we have a great wealth of knowledge. Just want to remind folks, there, we have a couple microphones if you guys have any questions of your own or want to participate in the conversation. Yeah, as, we, as we're talking about risk, you know, there's regulatory risk, there's compliance risk, but then there's also the fraud risk. And we're seeing that you know, that is increasingly automated. It's run by these cyber crime groups you know, coming on the heels of the ransomware attack. You know, this is a perfect time to be talking about fraud. And you're on the front lines, Abby. So how are you guys dealing with this automation that's coming at us? Yeah, I think the most important tool is having machine learning rules and the AI um, that can help us to catch this really quickly. Um, and outside of the tech, I found that information sharing, talking to FBI agents in my region and the prosecutors, if they give me um, some ideas about what's happening, how they've seen these bad actors participating in the, in the space, I can build rules around that. And so, it's, two, it's twofold, right? The technology has to be there and your technology has to be sharp enough to be able to react, um, but your technology is just as good as the information that you put into it. Like the raw data has to be also good. And so we, we're, we do both. Well, we're, go ahead. Get. Oh, I was, I was just gonna um, build on, on Abby's point. One of the things we talk with our clients a lot about is that fraud is not a competitive sport and fraud and risk um, leaders really need to work sort of as part of a larger community that includes the vendors, that includes the card brands, NACHA and, and the other RPAs, um, to, to collaborate, to, um, to actually bring data sources together. Because sometimes one um, data universe is, is too small 
to be able to, to, um, to make the necessary connections that are required to, to identify fraud that's lurking. Yeah, it's interesting because you know, before my time at IT Group, I, I managed the product team at Early Warning Services, and that was our mantra, is mm -hmm. fraud is not a competitive issue. However, I, I didn't need am, to steal it. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a good mantra, but I, I'm actually seeing a dynamic shifting a bit in that fraud is, to some extent, becoming a competitive issue. Because if you can be the payment processor or the acquirer that can onboard a merchant in hours or minutes, as opposed to two to five days, you're going to get that business. And so it's, it's an interesting dynamic that we're seeing evolve here. And as we see you know, the, the rapidly rising CNP fraud right now, you know, the, the attacks are rising. We're also starting to see the losses come up, although in the US market, they're still pretty much commensurate with our 15 to 16% growth of e-commerce as a whole. But as we squeeze you know, the four and a half billion dollars of counterfeit fraud out of our ecosystem as we move to EMV, you know, we're gonna see that CNP fraud rise. So you know, what types of emerging technologies are you seeing out there, Steve, that can help with both this fraud problem as well as our KYC challenge? You know, I think um, the answer to fraud, you know, there's probably two schools of thought on this. Uh, one is that everybody has their own special recipe, a little bit better than the next. Uh, it's a bit of an art form, you know, fraud, fraud prevention. Um, and that's definitely one way to approach it. Uh, I think, though, that maybe the evolution could be in this. There's little signs, uh, like there are in all things identity these days, um, that a consortium view of a trusted identity is probably the largest, um, well, I wouldn't even call it the largest, probably the most promising uh, signal out there. And so when I say a consortium view of identity, uh, an example of that would be, and it kind of exists with some vendors in certain regions already where uh, a certain vendor that manages identities uh, will have most of the market and, you know, as a result, has a view across many customers of those identities. And so it becomes a de facto identity network within those customers. And everybody's kind of going after that for their own you know, greedy purposes. I have this network. But the reality is, is that with these um, you know, new technologies like WePay and others that can bring in these new models for payments and, and merchants, they're global. Uh, that consortium view needs to be global because the bad actors, um, whether you're, you know, it's a regulator looking at that, that merchant in one way or the risk department looking at in another. Uh, moving to a trusted digital identity model where if you're not known, there's risk, is probably the better model scalable around the world. And then we can, what we can build is a standard and a, a trust framework online, which is what we've been after for years, uh, that is really, um, the borders are relevant because, yes, underneath governments will provide some data, customers will provide some data, but having and adopting a standard that allows a digital identity to move through cyberspace in a frictionless way that captures the value that has already been created in that identity. You know, whether it's good or bad, there's, there's velocity to those identities, and if it's new, um, People, it's like kind of like in, in the, I always kind of draw this analogy to the real world. If you're unknown in a community, you move to a small town and no one knows you, you're new to the network. So you're on board to spend some time and investment building up your identity in that community. Everyone understands that. It's really no different online. A user is not uh, completely turned off by that fact. What they hate is the repetitiveness of it abandoning my reputation and my identity and doing it again and again and again and again. And it's annoying for the user, but it's also very, very impractical for vendors and, and uh, partners because it abandons all of that, that value. It just leaves it. And so I think as we all kind of look at transactional fraud, uh, and we see this scale and move away uh, from offline payments into online, maybe there's a better way. And I think that a trusted identity model where there's a consortium view of that identity is the only scalable way to proceed because if you look at our lives offline, that's also the only scalable way to proceed. I travel here on my Canadian passport, and it's a credential that can get me in most places in the world, and I think that we need some standard like that. Um, without it, 
It's, uh, imagine arriving at the border without that document, in today's world especially. What would I be facing? And yet I present this little blue book and then I go. And I think that this type of trust framework already exists. So why we're trying to reinvent mm -hmm. this constantly? And let's, let's re-vet Stephen every time he comes to the US all over again. That's what it feels like online. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited about projects and technologies that have the ability, at least, even in their infancy, to scale in, in, in that manner. I think it's a very, very sexy way to move forward. Well, and I think it's so important at this point because you know, the basic data, the criminals have all of that right. with all these database breaches. They've got our credentials because 50% of consumers still use the same set of credentials across <laughs> all those online relationships. Yeah. They've got our PII. So it has to be about that broader identity and those digital elements and the reputation associated with them. It does. Otherwise, they're, they're just going to keep winning. Yeah. And most fraud is not executed by sort of a lone wolf sitting in his basement, however well sort of technologically enabled he, he may be. Most of the fraud, at least most of the, the fraud that, that we find is, is syndicated. It's, it's you know, mob, mob sort of directed. Uh, it's, it doesn't know borders. Ordinarily, when we'll, we'll take down a bad merchant, we will you know, leverage our, our machine learning to connect that business to five, six, 10 other merchants, half of which are sitting inactive in some acquirer's portfolio. Not doing anything, you know, obviously illegal, but just waiting until they need to, um, you know, to, to pop up and, and, and replace some merchant that got terminated. Criminals um, de-risk their businesses too, and they do it by, you know, having uh, businesses lying wait, in wait all over the world. So we're in this brave new payments ecosystem where it's increasingly digital. We have the, the, the consumer and the merchant demand for less friction. We have the need for speed. We have this, these criminals coming at us. What, I'm gonna ask each of you this, and I'll start with Abby. You know, what is, what's the key to you know, succeeding and getting ahead of your competition in this business? I think that for my business specifically, I have two pain points. Uh, identity, that's the friction, right? You onboard, I need to know who you are before I let this money out the door and it increasingly becomes a problem. So innovation around identity, just as you were talking about, I think it's really important to succeed here. <clears throat> and then the machine learning and, and for the transaction monitoring aspect of it. Um, I think that's gonna be really great, but getting it into the tool, in a, into our tools that are already built poses challenges, right? But once you're able to get that done, I think it, it gives you that competitive advantage that um, that could take you to the next level. So if, you, if, we're, if we pay specifically is able to do this, answer the question of identity and also make sure that our, our models are firing and our, our machine learning is, is turning, then I think that'll put us in a good place. And before we go to Steve, I wanna just pause on that for one second. So you're talking about machine learning. Are you using it for AML as well? And if so, how, how's that conversation with the regulator? Um, I, so we pay is not regulated. We have a bank partner model. Um, so I'm not really talking to them at all. Uh, and I am using it for AML. Uh, and the banks don't really understand what we're doing, right? Just as long as we're catching the bad guys is all they really care about. They look at our rules. They say, this is great. This is, this is awesome. But not, no other conversation than that's happening, really. You're in a fortunate part of the ecosystem. <laughs> Very fortunate until I'm not, right? <laughs> kind of just waiting for the shoe to drop. <laughs> Steve, what, what's the key for, for competing in this new, new era? Well, look, I think um, we touched on it. Um, from, a, from a client perspective for us, it's about automation and speed. And um, that's kind of, at least the principles of our business are how can we make the onboarding process less, with less friction but more trust? Uh, a, a reality, and then even within the identity space, uh, which is very principal to this whole discussion, I think the key for success is gonna be continued collaboration. 
And so we've seen, um, even here in the U.S. for the last five years, uh, President Obama wrote to industry and said, we really need to focus on this. And we have seen some momentum here in the U.S. since then. There's the NSTIC and um, other projects uh, that are focused on digital, uh, trusted, identi trusted digital identities and cyberspace initiatives. And that really kind of started the waves with other governments around the world. This, um, so that, that needs to continue. And then I think the last piece for me is whether you call it inclusion or whether you call it um, globalization, thinking about the, eliminating borders, whether it's a payments business or an identity verification business or a fraud business, you have to think that way. If you don't and you continue to build regional solutions, you will become totally irrelevant. It's just not that way anymore. And so when people stand up new services that are in this space that are regional, it, to me, it, it's a very uh, antiquated model. Doesn't reflect current commerce. It well. doesn't. Or, or where consumers shop or, or things that they, it really doesn't reflect anything anymore. And so um, if the retail industry is any indication, we've been banging on that drum saying, oh, it's gonna, Amazon and their competitors are gonna disrupt. And now we see what we see. So how late to the party do you want to be, I think? And yeah. it's, it applies to this whole space. Manan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we covered most of the points. But I think you know, what strikes me when I think about this is we are actually at this pretty interesting you know, sp you know, time in the evolution of payments and identity, both. And I think you know, that intersection of payments and identity, and I think there are multiple tailwinds that are supporting the journey. One, I think, you know, as I said, there's a large government you know, kind of push on both fronts. If you talk to most governments in emerging markets, their two biggest priorities right now is one is identity, two is financial inclusion. And I think you know, those two Getting behind those two tailwinds, I think, is critical. The other tailwind is this whole like digitization, you know, that's happening. So if we look at, you know, a recent example is uh, go back to it is you know demonetization that happened in India, and we look at you know who were the merchants who came on board. They were not merchants who signed up with a traditional acquirer. Uh, you know, maybe had to go through a traditional underwriting process, wait for two or three weeks or maybe even a month, whatever it is, right, to, get, to be onboarded. They were people who opted in for a digital wallet, uh, you know, had instant kind of uh, sign up for it. They could download a QR code which had a virtual prepaid card at the back of it. Uh, you know, just really, really easy processes by which merchants could be part of a payment ecosystem. And I think you know, this whole digital era will lead to you know, us collectively coming up with ways to, and we already are. And I think you know, it, the other piece I think is a great tailwind is the emergence of you know, the tech you know, industry to kind of drive processes and systems that will allow consumers to take advantage of these tailwinds. So I think you know, that to me stands out as some of the key aspects that will allow us to succeed. Absolutely. And Allison, you get the last word. Sure. So two things. One, I think gradually the industry is getting away from this concept of underwriting being something you do once at the beginning, but moving to continuous underwriting, which is definitely a message that we promote. Um, compliance activities usually aren't enough to justify um, or, to, or to, to replace um, continuous underwriting, which is that robust and thorough check you do at the outset needs to be repeated um, very frequently. Uh, and then the second is there, there really isn't, uh, from our perspective, uh, a single standard globally for a small business risk. You can get credit, you can get merchant risk, you can get reputation. Uh, and one of the, the things that we're, we're driving forward with some of our partners um, is this concept of um, a holistic view of small business risk maintained um, in, in real time to facilitate that continuous underwriting. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time and insights today. And uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.